Well, I think uh, the UN, first, there's some competition. I mean, whether you like it or not. I mean, the member states of the UN have reacted rather negatively to the emergence of the G20. Uh, there is fear on the part of the UN that the G20 might take over some of the things and issues that the, that the UN has been dealing with. And in that sense, sort of uh, overstep or step on the turf of the UN. Uh, and so that has caused some anxiety and there's a bit of a rea negative reaction from, from, from a broad, broad cross-section of the UN membership. And I think the 3G, the Global Governance Group, which Singapore has created with 27 other countries, is meant to try to help build a bridge, a uh, bridge, a soft bridge, a bridge to build dialogue between the UN and the G20. At the same time, I think the, 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 the fact that the G20 has emerged is not a bad thing for the UN. It provides some competition, and I think that means the UN will have to relook its own internal processes and see how it can improve itself and meet the challenges of the 21st century. Well, there's always the fear that, you know, the G20 might arrive at a decision and try to impose that decision on the rest of the UN membership, which is not there at the table to take part in the discussions, which therefore does not have a say, but which has a decision being sort of pushed down its throat. That really is a concern, I think, of the wider membership. They would like to be involved somehow in the G20 discussions. It's not possible for everyone to be there at the table. If you have too big a group, it doesn't make sense. As it is, 20 countries sitting around a table has been perceived by some to be a rather overcrowded table. So I think it's important to somehow involve and engage the rest of the UN membership. That means reaching out to them, explaining the G G20 agenda. It need be getting feedback on whether the agenda of the G20 is in line with the wishes of the wider UN community. It need be make adjustments to the agenda and taking the views of the wider UN membership. At the same time, we have this idea of variable geometry, which allows non-G20 members to participate in some of the discussions of the G20 either at the summit level or maybe even better still at the specialized level when they're discussing finance issues or you know labor issues or food security issues. It's good to have countries that have a direct interest in those issues somehow sitting there and giving their views to the G20. That's real life, I mean, problems being dealt with by the G20 and for these countries too, it means life and death. Well, I think the SG should be there. You know, he, may, he cannot represent uh, the individual views of the UN membership, but he can represent the collective sense of the House. And that's what he's there for. If you're talking of making sure the G20 does things in a manner that does not undermine the UN, then it's important to send a signal to the wider UN membership that the UN has a place at the table. And what better way than for the SG to be there at the table to sort of represent the sense of the House. Well, there are a couple of things that the last two chairs and the current chair have been doing, which is really to come down to New York often before meetings, big meetings, not just summit meetings, but finance meetings and other Sherpa meetings, to take soundings on the wider UN membership as well as from the Secretariat. First, the Secretariat should be involved in, in any case in all these meetings at the Sherpa level. Having said that, it's equally important for them to come down to New York, the G20 Sherpas, to talk to not just the wider UN membership, but also the Secretariat to find out how they could work closely with the Secretariat in promoting some of the agendas of the UN. Ah, that's, you know, that's something that uh, we've talked about at some length and uh, really it's important for the G20 countries to take a consultative approach with the rest of the UN membership. The chairs are doing it in the sense that you've had the Canadian chair, the Korean chair, the current French chair coming down to talk to the wider UN membership about the, about the issues on the G20 agenda. The rest of the G20 countries sort of stay out of the discussions because they leave it to the chair to do the talking because they're not in the chair. I think some of them can actually play a more active role because eventually they'll be taking over as chairs in any case. And it's important, I think, for them to also show the same commitment to the UN by organizing meetings, engaging the wider UN membership, and sometimes, sometimes representing meetings with their respective constituencies. For example, you know, if you're Argentina or Brazil, I would expect them to meet with the Latin American group. If you're China or India or Japan, I would expect them to meet quite frequently with the Asian group, Asian countries, so that they could basically get feedback from their respective constituencies and regions on what they should feed into the G20 process. It's in a way already in place. You have got five guests being invited by the G20 chair. Uh, one of them, two seats have been reserved for Africa, African Union and Nepal. The chairs of these two groupings are there. So they're representing a certain constituency, the African group.
We have also had ASEAN being invited to these meetings to represent the Southeast Asian countries' views. You also had Spain, which is really a de facto G20 member, being invited on a regular basis. And occasionally, they do invite others as well. I mean, another country, for example, Singapore was invited last time and, uh, and the, for the forthcoming meeting in Cannes as well as the coordinator of the 3G. So in some ways, the system is there. I think we need to make it work more effectively by identifying the various groups or constituencies that need to be represented by proxies. You know, there are groupings that, are, that fall through the cracks. You know, either they're not represented by the 3G or the ASEAN group or AU or NEPAD. So we need to look for ways in which others can be brought on board. You know, for example, the United Arab Emirates has been invited this time around as a representative of the GCC. That's a good sign. You know, it's an application of variable geometry, widening the outreach to the, to the wider membership. But I think we, we have to find ways in which they can be involved. It's difficult to involve them at the summit level because you need to have to keep the numbers down to maximum of 25, 20 plus five invited guests. But I think what they can do is try to open up the participation at the specialized level, meaning when Sherpas and officials meet, you can actually broaden the outreach, and broaden the inclusion, broaden the participation to include other non-G20 countries. So you could have 30 people sitting around a table. At the officials level, I think it's fine. At the leaders level, you want a certain amount of intimacy and uh, discussion at a much closer level. There you need to keep the numbers down. Well, they are supposed to represent their respective constituencies' views. But I think uh, it's also an indication from the G20 that they're trying to reach out to the UN membership. But I think it's equally important that whoever sits there at the table is able to add value to the discussions. My own view is that you don't invite someone just for the sake of having someone there. That person or the country being invited should be able to add value to the discussions. And that's sometimes the record has been mixed. I mean, I'm not so sure whether every country that's there invited is able to participate in a constructive manner. We were there in uh, Singapore was invited as a 3G coordinator to the last meeting in Seoul. And I think we played a critical role in some of the discussions that took place, at least at the Sherpa level and at the, at the leaders level too. Uh, because our interventions on some issues like currency exchange, you know, the, the problem between China and the US, I think had to involve a third party. And Singapore played the convenient role of trying to bridge the positions between the US and China on that important issue. So I think you can play the role, but you need to bring value and you're pre prepared to take a position on the issues. You're just going to be there to keep quiet and to just signal to the world that you've been invited. That I think, I think it's a waste of time. I think they attach great importance to all three, the Bretton Woods, the G20, as well as the UN. The UN is after all the, universally, the universal body. So I think the emerging powers would like to have a greater status in that body for a start. Which is why some of them are trying to get themselves appointed or elected, elected rather, as permanent members of the Security Council. Well, the second best option, of course, is G20. But G20 deals mainly economic issues. But in some ways, it is a proxy or a substitute, you know, for the enlarged Security Council. Because the composition of the G20 is interesting. It includes the P5, includes all the emerging powers, those aspiring for a permanent seat and those who are not aspiring for a permanent seat, or opposed to a permanent seat for others, but still are emerging powers. So it's an interesting grouping of countries. They're probably the 20 most important countries in the world. You could take one, of, you know, one away or add one, but the point is really they represent, I think, the mix of countries that are the most important in world affairs. So in some ways, the fact that there is recognition for a place for a, for in a body like that for the emerging powers, I think is a good sign. Well, for a start, I think the UN will have to reform some of its internal processes. Its working methods are rather cumbersome, outdated, and things get done very slowly, hardly, we hardly move on many issues, we take ages to get things done. I think uh, resistance to change is very much ingrained in the UN DNA. I think we need to find a way to overcome that. There's a discussion coming up in June on global governance. Hopefully the discussion will spur the UN to do some of these major reforms, at least in the decision-making area, on important issues of the day. I am personally not that optimistic because, you know, these discussions, are, they take place all the time. Uh, people show anxiety and interest when the discussions take place. But after a while, they sort of go back into their ordinary, regular mode, and that doesn't help the UN in many ways. I think this time around, the emergence of the G20 has been a wake-up call, has served as a wake-up call for the UN, because for the first time, you have a grouping of countries, not just made up of the developed world, where you have developed and the emerging powers sitting together. That really, that really raises issues of you know, challenging the primacy of the UN in some ways.
you have the Indias, Brazils and China sitting on the other side, not in the UN context, but with the rich countries discussing global issues. That means the UN has to do something to respond to this challenge. Well, if the G20 can come up with interesting ideas on, on how the UN should function, I'm, I'm sure they can present it to the UN, wider membership of the UN for discussion. I mean, that's not a priority at this point for the G20. Their priority really is on the economic and global, global uh, financial crisis. And that's where they should be focusing their energies on for this time, at this point in time. But I think at some point in time, they might very well get down to discussing it. The French have talked about Security Council reform. That's a very specific issue. Uh, but, you know, with the way the G20 is structured, it could very well move into new areas. And one of the areas they could possibly discuss in the long run, not that I'm encouraging them, but I mean something they might do is UN reform and how the UN can better itself and position itself much better in the face of all these challenges and changes.